Okay, good morning, everybody. As we go to the chitas of today, today is Wednesday. Tainus Esther, the fast day of Esther. And um, the fourth reading in the portion of Sav. And now the Taita continues, we're holding on chapter eight, verse number one. And God spoke to Moshe saying, Take Adam and his sons with him, and all the garments, and the anointing oil, and the bull offering that they need to bring, and the two rams, and the unleavened bread, which is they're supposed to bring for the inauguration. And Rashi says, this section is stated seven days before the erection of the sanctuary, and it should be stated earlier in Exodus, Pashas Bekude, which discusses the erection and concentration process. However, there's no sequence earlier or later events in the title. So even though this Pasha should have been written in a couple of weeks ago, there's no a muktum a muchabat it doesn't always go in chronological, chronological order. Pachas adding, take them over with impressive words to attract them. Inspire them in their dedication because this was a very hard job. This was not an easy job and nobody would just jump on this job and run to do it. So therefore, tell Aaron the, 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 the great schos that he has, inspire him that he, that he has a great supposed to do that. Uh, and the sin offering bull, two rams and a basket of eleven bread, which sin offering bull, two, which are these? These are the ones mentioned in the section dealing with the command of the investors in Pasha's Ba'ata to the Tava in chapter 29 in, in the book of Shemais. And now and now, on the first day of the investors, it came, up, it came back and urged him in the matter. At the time, they were put to practice. Verse number three, an entire, and, and assemble the entire community at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And I said, this one, the instance with a small area accommodated a large number of people. Because how is it possible to invite all the Jews into the uh, into the courtyard of the of the Mishkan, it was extremely extremely a small place, and for surely for the millions of Jews that were there to be able to put them into such a small place, so this is a, this is a, is a, this is a very interesting expression in the Gemara. I mean, she is a mother with a small place held a lot of people. And that's one of the miracles that happened in the Beis Hamidosh, that even in the Beis Hamidosh, which is a bigger place, but to be able to handle on, on El Asliya, every, every Yantiv, all Yidin from all around and Yisrael coming into the Beis Hamidosh was extremely, extremely, either it was extremely pushy or it was extremely miraculous to have all Jews in the Beis Hamidosh. Even the Gemara says, that even all Jews in Yerushalayim, to be able to all Yidin to come to Yerushalayim was a miracle that nobody complained, the Gemara says, nobody complained when they came, when they came to Beis Amikdash on the holiday that they were not comfortable in Yerushalayim. And that was extremely, extremely, millions of people coming to Yerushalayim over Yontiv. So it's, it's amazing how everybody was comfortable in, this, in the city of Yerushalayim, and not only, not only a one-day period, it became for eight days. Verse number four, did, but they gathered the, the whole nation of Pesach to the, to the door of the tent of meeting. They all came into the courtyard of the Mesa Midosh. said to the community, Hashem says, this is what the Abish commanded. <coughs> so Mesh Rabbeinu said to the Jews, these are the things, the things you will see me doing before you. 
have been commanded to me by the Holy One, blessed be. Yeah, well, it'll be done. So do not say that I am among, I am doing them on my own honor or my brother's honor. I've explained the entire past involving in the, the, this, this ceremony. This ceremony actually was done seven days until the eighth day when, when Aaron became the Kayan, Gadol. So this was done for seven days. And uh, they put apart, they took apart the base of they put apart together for seven days. And uh, Mesh Rabbeinu wanted to make sure that he either knew that it wasn't his own idea, but also we know later, Kedach challenged Mesha on this concept, that he became the Nasi and his brother Aaron became the high priest, was challenged by Mesh Rabbeinu, by, by, by Kedach later on. He bathed him, put him in a mikvah. He took a tatus and he placed upon him a tunic. And he put a he put a sash up around it. And he clothed out in the meal. He put upon him the ephod. He put upon him the ephod. He greeted him in the hand of the ephod, and he adorned him with him. He put a, he gave Aaron to he gave Aaron the chayshin. So he put him, and he put into the chayshin the urim v'tumim. What's the urim v'tumim? So the Ashi says the urim v'tumim is an inscription bearing the explicit name of God. So the the urim v'tumim is a piece of paper. Or, uh, so, that was put the name that Moshe Rabbeinu knew one of the names of God that he put on that in there and he put it into the into the chayshin, the flap remember the chayshin was made out of a, two parts that were put together one, one piece that was folded in half the chayshin is where the breastplate was, was where the, uh, the, the, the 12 uh, stones were the names of the tribes then he put he placed the hat upon his head. But and he put it placed towards his face the golden show place, show plate. the holy crown. God commanded me. he placed on the cap the blue. The sky blue accord fixed to the show plate, he placed over the cap. Thus, the show plate was suspended out on the cap. Because the show plate, you remember, had a string in the middle, two strings on the side, and they both came, he put the strings over his head, tied it on the back with the two other strings. So ultimately, it was hanging, so to say, from his head. From his cap, from his hat. First time, the Meishar Ben took the anointing oil, and he anointed the sanctuary, the Chayat Kol Asher Boy, and everything that was in it. He kadoshes them and he sanctified them. First of all, Yazim Men Alam is Beach, and then he sprinkled from it upon the altar, Sheva Pum, Yishma, 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 Yishma. And he anointed as a mezbeach, the altar. But it's called Caleb in all its vessels. It's Akir, the washstand. That's Kanai and its base. The Kacham to sanctify. This is one of the statements of Rashi in his humility. Rashi over here says, says I do not know. I do not know. Where in scripture was commanded to do this sprinkling. Where before he was to, commanded to anoint it, but where did Moshe Rabbeinu get this, that he sprinkled the Mizbeach seven times? I don't know, Rashi says. Where he got that from? There are other commentaries that explain this, but Rashi says, he says, I don't know. I don't know. That shows you the humility of Rashi. That he says, I don't know. And he poured from the anointing oil upon Alesh Aaron, the head of Aaron, and he anointed him, but Katshe to sanctify. So I says, first he poured the oil on Aaron's head, and afterwards he placed it between his eyelids. 
and drew it in his finger from one eyelid to the other. So he put on the head and then he moved it down and brought it between his eyelids. And then Moshe Rabbeinu brought the sons of Adam. And he closed them in their tunics. And he put a sash around them. He banded them in the high hats. Kashativa Hashem as Moshe as God commanded Moshe. With Ashley bound them, expression donating binding by Yechbesh means to tie something. So the Kehanim were well tied up, as we know. That completes the Chumash for today. We now go to the Tanya of the day. The Rebbe continues to explain the greatness of a mitzvah. That when we perform, when we perform the mitzvah, however, with pure and permissible object, the mitzvah elevates the object from klipas neige, from a shield that, that, that shines, to holiness, to be united with ain't safe light, with the God as the altar of the Kitzvah. So the Alter Rebbe says a mitzvah is, is self-understood if I do it for the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, because that is God's will. So when I do the mitzvah, I unite the mitzvah with a unity with God, because that's his will. So now his will. And, and that concept becomes one. It's like, in, it's, it's like anything you do for another person even. If you fulfill another person's will, you connect him with that concept. Now he, he says he has something that was fulfilled according to his will. There's an expression where the will of a person is, that's where he, he is found. So the same thing with God, where his will is accomplished, that's where the Abishta is. So what happens when you do a mitzvah, a physical mitzvah? You have to look at it that you're redeeming the spark of God that's in the mitzvah. So the Abishta's will is in this, in this physical thing. Because the Abishta created, you know, the statement in the Mishnah, whatever God created was for his own glory. So when I take the physical thing and I use it out for God's glory, I'm basically releasing this, the spark of God that's in this physical thing, and I'm connecting it with its source with its true reason why it was created. That's why, we, that's why we make a bracha, for example, on food. Because we're not just eating the food for our energy. We're eating the food for, we say God's name over the food. So we're releasing the God spark that's in the food to connect with God's name, with its source. So now, not only I'm eating the food because I need energy, but there's a godly spark in the food, the kosher food, that, that now is elevated and re released and returned and connected to its source. And that's how the Alter Rebbe explained it. But now, when one filled God commanded and will with this object, the spark, the vitality that's in this physical thing, Oila is released, battle is dissolved, Benichlau and is absorbed, but Oil ain't safe but in the light of God. is because which is the will that is clothed in the mitzvah. That is true, the true will. So what is God? The God, what's the true will in this in this in this in this piece of cloth, the piece of Parchment is that it should be done a mitzvah with it. Now I turn it into a mezuzah, I turn it into tzolok, or, or simply I make a bracha over food. The second I make a bracha over food, I have now separated, in essence, two entities in the food. There's a physical side of food, the nourishment, the energy, physical energy that helps the body, and there is the spiritual energy that has now been connected to its real reason of why it was created. 
because for the mitzvah, there's no concealment of the continents, whatever, whatsoever, to the high light, to, to hide his light, preventing the object from being absorbed into the light. I stated earlier, whenever the answer stands revealed, there's no separation from God. Everything is united in his light. In this case, the object, which is the mitzvah, representing the revelation of his will and the light of El Seif is, is performed. So that's what happened. So the second I do the bracha, the second I do, I take the physical thing, I use it out for a godly purpose, that moment I release a godly entity which is in this physical thing, I unite it with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and now we become, it becomes one. The energy of, the, of this physical thing or the spark of God that's in, the, in this physical thing, and now becomes united with its source, and there is nothing hidden whatsoever. And this happened through a physical concept. There we see that real spirituality is revealed through a physical thing, not through a spiritual dimension, but actually through a physical dimension. And that's why it says again that the shamans that are in heaven are jealous of a Jew that's in this world that could do a mitzvah. Even all the angels in heaven are all jealous of a Jew that does a mitzvah in this world. Right? Well, Shemta said that the, all, the, all, the, all, the, all the angels in heaven are jealous of one Amen Yehesh Meirab of a Jew. That a Jew in this world can say Amen Yehesh Meirab with all the skayach, with all the strength, they cannot do that. And only a Jew through a physical reality, through his, his own body, can scream out, Amen Yehesh Meirab. And they're jealous of that. So that's the power of a physical thing, of a, the power of revelation of a physical thing. Because there is revealed the essence, true Ratzayim of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in this world. So thus far, the Alter Rebbe has discussed the effect of a mitzvah on the object used in its performance, like the esrog, the parchment, etc. He now discusses the effect of the power of a Jew's animal soul that is that is applied to the mitzvah. Right? Because now we're talking not about the mitzvah, but about the Jew who does the mitzvah. When a Jew does a mitzvah, he doesn't only do it with his godly soul. He does it with his animal soul because his animal soul is the one that gives his body existence. So every mitzvah I do, I do it with my animal soul. So this soul, like the, like the object, does like, now if you're mad, does like a mitzvah get done through a physical object, a kosher physical object, comes from what's called klipas neiga eight shell that shines so too my body we learned the chassidus my body my physical side of me my nefesh abahamis my animalistic soul also comes from klipat noga but a shell that shines so now when I do a mitzvah not only do I reveal the godliness in this physical thing but I ultimately reveal the godliness in my own self my animal soul because I'm using my animal soul to do this mitzvah. Because no, because a godly soul cannot do a mitzvah without a body. So no godly soul that's in heaven that waited thousands of years to come into my body and now is in my body. Why did it come into the waited? My soul was created before creation. So my soul has been 5,000 years old. And it's been waiting and waiting and waiting. When is it going to come down to my body? Because with all its spiritual revelations above, it cannot do a mitzvah. Now it comes to my body and waiting to do a mitzvah. Because now it can do, use the body and do a mitzvah, which it couldn't do all its life, all its existence. And after it leaves the body, it still can, it won't be able to do it again. So this is the beauty. 
The beauty is also about the person himself. So the rise by Tafik is like them. It experiences a similar elevation in the realm of wholeness whenever it's used in the service of a mitzvah. Being observed into the divine will represented by the mitzvah. I'm transforming myself. Similarly, the power, the vitalizing animal soul. So the very ragguf or the makayma mitzvah is that clothed in the whole little body limbs of a person who performs a mitzvah. Who must lavish gamke basi is there is also clothed in this mitzvah. So when I give zdaka, my hand now became a vehicle for a mitzvah. When I put on tefillin, my hand becomes a vehicle. When I wor- say words of Torah, my, my brain, my eyes, my mouth, my ears, all become a vehicle. That's one of the reasons why chassidim shake when they daven or when they learn. Because they don't only want to learn with their mouth, they want to learn with the whole body. They want everything to move. Everything should be part of this mitzvah. Because then I have now used the body for a godly purpose. That transformed the body, even, even if it's for a moment. It has transformed the body to be a vehicle of godliness. And even though the body might be so mundane and coarse that it doesn't feel the godliness that has now been clothed within it, but that's what happens. The oil of clipper. At that moment, it ascends from the impurity, the clipper from the from the from the from the shell, the nichlal bigdusha. It clothed itself, it absorbed itself in the holiness of the mitzvah. She did is baruch, which is the will of God, and it's nullified in the eiden safe in this life, because I'm doing the mitzvah with my guf, with my body. There's no mitzvah in the world that I can do without my body. Now, the Rebbe now goes on to say that those mitzvahs involve speech alone. Likewise, affect this elevation of the animal soul. Even though, even, even though here, the animal soul's power is not brought to bear in the performance of any mitzvah, of course, it's only speech. But we know the Gemara says that speech is an action. So too in the mitzvah of learning, so too even though learning is not a, is not a mitzvah, it's not, a, it's, not a, it's a mitzvah, but it's not a, seemingly not a physical action. Even though they do not have an actual physical action, which is on the domain of klipa. Like taking something physical and using it out for, like taking a lulav and an essig and using it. That's mama. You take something, a lulav and essig, it's a tree and a brat, and you're turning it mama into a mitzvah. You take a, you take paper and you turn it into a safer. That's why your home should be full of Jewish books because it should be full of books that have been tra- transformed into a holy concept. But what is speech? We hold the We know there's a general law. Thought is not does not substitute speech. We know that you don't you cannot learn and you cannot do the mitzvah of davening unless you say it with your mouth. The kaimalan and the accepted rule that the moving of one's lips constitutes an action. And such an action, as the Rebbe notes, likewise stems from the vitality of the clippus nega that is nourished by the animal soul, as does the actual body action spoken earlier. So, so too speech, my capability of speech comes by, from my vital soul. I, don't, I speak because of my vital soul. The powers of my vital soul, which is part of my animalistic soul. So I speak and I listen and I see. All these come from the vital 
from the, the, the power of the, the vital soul, which is the animal soul. And therefore, ultimately, if I see good things, if I speak good things, if I surely speak I say words of Taita, and I dive in with, uh, with my, I don't dive in my thought, I dive in with my mouth, with my words, then I've accomplished an action. Because this is a general rule. <laughs> Your godly soul cannot speak. It could speak spirituality <laughs> in a spiritual concept, but it cannot speak words. Divine soul cannot express it without the physical lips, mouth, tongue, or teeth. The instrument of speech. Except by the ways of the vitalizing animal soul actually clothed in the organs of the body. And therefore, the more I talk, the more I take my, my powers of my body and use it out for Kedusha, for holy things. So the, the divine soul is entirely spiritually. The body is physical. Therefore, the divine soul cannot act active, the body to perform it, except through the, this intermediary, the body. This intermediary is the animal soul, in which on one hand is a soul, a spiritual life force, and on the other hand, actually clothes itself in the body and the bodily organs. This intermediary is necessary in mitzvahs performed through speech, thus as a mitzvah performed through action. For articulating the words required for the mitzvah also constitutes physical action, so that this too cannot be accomplished by divine soul except by the way of the animal soul's power of speech. Hence, the more forcefully one speaks the words of Teda and prayer, he puts the more strength, the more you put into learning. So you just sit there, you just you know, you take it as a relaxing uh, moment. No, learning has to be through your gear, through work. And the more energy you put into the learning, the more energy you put into davening, the more you elevate your animal soul. Thereby, it converts more energy of the clipper into home. This is what's written, all my bones shall declare God who is like me. Which means that the words of Torah prayer must be said with all one's bones. It has to penetrate you. It has to be done with all everything. Don't, don't just get involved halfway. Be totally involved, body and soul. So as much as possible bodily energy be utilized in the performance of a mitzvah. This is what our sages of blessed memory said. If the Torah abides in all 240 year, limbs, it will be preserved. If the Torah is only in your mind, if I leave the Torah onto my mind, but my body is given over to the world, then ain't a mishta medis. You have to. So, you know, the expression at the end of a shas, we say, honor rats and mehem rats. Everybody's jogging. Everybody's running. Some people are only running for their health. And some people are running for the mitzvah. Have a rats of thy mitzvah. Don't only run to, because your body needs to be healthy. Run to a mitzvah. What do you think God created running for? Should run to show. Call out smoisei to mind. I that every part of my body is involved in a mitzvah. It's not only my mind. I leave my mind. No, I got to bring my heart. I got to bring my bones. I got to bring every ounce of myself and be focused. And when I do a mitzvah, I do it with my whole existence. And that's why. 
real learning and davening makes you tired. And this is a kind of one weakens the power of the power of the body. So if I if I would daven and learn like I work, like I do my enjoyment, it would push it, make me tired. I would feel tired from the learning. Because if I just learn with my brains, why, why would that tire me? But if I learn with my whole body and I put my whole kaiches, my whole strength, and my whole physical reality into this learning, it's going to weaken the power of the body and it's going to make you tired physically. And, and that's weakening the animal. So applying all the strength to the holy ter- the holiness of Torah and prayer. This then is the meaning of the, the of the previous quote, quotation. When one involves the energy of his 248 limbs of Torah, he preserves his memory for the clipper that closes, causes one to forget it has been weakened. And that's why we should always put our whole strength, not only in doing a mitzvah, but in the way we daven, in the way we learn Torah, etc., etc. And that completes the Tanya of today. Today is the 13th day of the month, and it's chapter 69, 70, and 71 in Tillam. 69, 70, and 71. My friends, tomorrow, tonight is Purim. Uh, it's a mitzvah to hear the Megillah reading tonight. The Chabad, we're going to read the Megillah. At, at, we're going to dive in Minchia tonight at 7.15. We're going to read the Megillah at uh, 7.45. We're going to have, hopefully, the uh, weather, weather, uh, weather uh, situation. Hopefully, we'll have three Megillah readings, uh, one inside, one outside, two outside, one for all the kids and families that want to come. We're having a whole party for the kids and family. And that's going to be uh, the kids program is at 645 outside. The Megillah reading for everybody is going to be around 745, 750, be that 745. Tomorrow is Purim. Don't forget that. We have to hear the Megillah again. We're going to read the Megillah here at Chabad three different times, four different times. We're going to read the Megillah at 730. We dive in at 7 o'clock. So at 730, we're going to read the Megillah. We're going to read the Megillah here at 9 a.m. And we're going to read the Megillah at 11. And then at 4.30, the last time we're going to read the Megillah here is at 4.30 p.m. We're having a big Sutta's Purim at 5 p.m. If you uh, need a place to go for the Sutta, call Chabad today at 487-2934. I want to wish you all a meaningful fast today. And um, uh, I hope to see you all over Purim. Tomorrow, we're going to do chitas at 9 a.m. So either you're going to come to the Megillah reading at 7.30, who's listening here, or at 11. But uh, we're going to do the, the, the chitas at 9 a.m. I wish you all a wonderful Purim, a happy Purim. I hope this Purim is a, is a, a transforming Purim for each and every one of us, that it should be, everything should be turned into joy and happiness. And hopefully for the whole world, this Purim will be a... Purim to remember, because the world is going to transform itself from negative to positive, and from sadness to joy, and from darkness to light. I wish you all a wonderful, beautiful, happy, healthy, phenomenal Purim. Have a great day.